good morning friends. Uh, last year I was here at the invitation of this forum and I am glad to be back to meet you all again. And uh, I like this forum mainly not because of anything than the participation of students. I strongly believe that uh, it is the students who are very, very important in any development issues. So I always like to share my uh, thoughts. And last time also, it was the students who raised a number of questions. It was very interesting, I think. Now let me take few minutes on that. And it is, I think, very improper on my part to talk on this, convey my thoughts when uh, uh, former Deputy Governor Mr. Khan, who has done extensive work on these things, and I should say a kind of torch bearer in these areas. And so whatever I say, it will be just a drop of what he knows and what he has uh, done. And uh, uh, pardon me, sir, if I am wrong. If I can. <laughs> you see, this financial inclusion is one of the most talked about uh, uh, topic currently. But it's not new. It's across the globe, financial inclusion is a very important uh, topic. Our country acquires significance because of its large size and uh, it's the experimental value that it derives for external people. It's so huge. Even the smallest state, if you take, it equals the size of some countries. So that whenever you do anything, it becomes a kind of uh, illumination for the global world. You take even the recent exercise which it had, the entire world is watching it with very great uh, interest as to what is the outcome of this recent uh, experiment. Now when we talk about uh, this uh, financial uh, inclusion, the most important thing, what is this financial, you know, why it should be there at all? Is it that it was not in earlier? Financial inclusion has been in different forms, in different uh, degrees, but it was not with this intensity it was being done. When the country grows and the economy grows, along with that the banking system grows because economy depends hugely on the banking system also. But when the banks grow, if the bank is going to grow only for the purpose of making profits, then it becomes difficult. It gets reduced to certain areas, certain domains of what is interest to the bank, not necessarily what is interest to the economy and its participants. And now you have seen that what was banking 30 years back and what was the banking today is totally different. It's totally different. Now when it is changing, then it is very, very important that all the citizens of the country, whatever level they are, must join that. Elites become part of that everything. The middle class slowly gets absorbed, but the lower level people left, remains left out as the things grow and grow. Suddenly you find there is a huge chunk of population which is outside this domain of financial services. It's not good for the country because unless they join together, the growth cannot have any meaning at all. Unless everybody is involved, the growth momentum and potential doesn't come into full blow. And therefore, it is necessary that they are also become inclusive or they are absorbed into the financial inclusion exercise. What is the financial inclusion then? We talk about financial services. Let me make it very without jargons in a simple way because the students in that. When we talk about financial services, if you start, you start with a savings bank account. Then you start transmitting money, you start taking loans. You go for insurance. So many products slowly develops. As you grow, your stature grows in your own business. But now opening a savings bank alone, account alone is not financial inclusion. Because I remember some of the banks when we started, Reserve Bank started in an extensive way into this. We started a lot of programs and all. Some of the banks used to declare this village is 100% accounts, this village is therefore we have included but that was not the end of it. By having one account, you are not going to be a part of the system. And that is why financial inclusion targets about providing access to all the financial services available to them 
in whatever manner they need it. Therefore, we wanted to ensure financial services are available to the public, the larger number of public who are downtrodden, lower and down. Now, the recent exercise of the Jandan account is a mammoth exercise where the account opening started. And even if you recall, it was started by saying that we will give some credit, but we did not, we suggested, Reza Bank said, let the accounts begin, let us wait for some time, because opening an account is not the end of financial inclusion, it is the beginning. Now, financial inclusion becomes a problem for the lower level, because they do not understand what is available, they do not understand what are all the products can do for them. And also they do not understand the risk associated with that and lastly they do not know what is the cost involved in that. You get 500 rupees in your account if you are going to spend 200 rupees for accessing that, there is no point in that. Therefore, financial inclusion should ensure that they have access, they have information and the cost is low. This is the whole thrust of financial inclusion. In that context you must have seen both the government and the RBI has been doing a lot. Government started a lot of accounts. They gave that credit card, I mean the debit card, rupee card to all the uh, uh, account holders so they, they can access. But many of them are not accessing. I was with the NPCA, I used to wa uh, watch the transactions. Then information about the product even if you give, how do they do that? Now, for example, one of the important thing that has come about is insurance which you may see that, that insurance for the lower level people. And even the government of India announced one uh, insurance, life insurance or the accident insurance and crop insurance. So slowly now they are being provided access to the financial services to take care of that so that in the event of calamity they do not, they are not broke and they are supported. And lastly cost, cost of transaction. If you see now if you go to the bank, if you do some services and all the cost is expensive. Many times we say why should we do this at all? We now start looking out whether should I do this way or that way or otherwise. But for them, even whatever way they look at it, it should not be very expensive. That is why the minimum balances are not there and the charges are very low. ATM in the rural areas are available much more freely. So that and now you must understand who bears the cost of that. The system has to bear the cost of that. Whenever the system bears the cost of that, the system always looks at it as a monetary point. Whereas from socially, you find the kind of changes that take place, the kind of growth that take place, the growth in turns bring more business to the uh, thing and to ensure that this takes place, Reserve Bank of India step went further to create payment banks so that they will focus only on payment system giving more thrust to the rural areas, small banks which will be giving more thrust to the rural centres and small business. In other words, now slowly the recognition of financial inclusion is no longer theory or concept, but it is gradually getting converted into actionable strategies by way of new institutions, new payment modes, lower cost and finally what is known as financial literacy. Now what is this financial literacy is about? Now financial literacy is about, some girl last time asked me, sir, we are all literate, why should you have any financial literacy? I said literacy, nobody in this audience can pronounce that they know everything in life. No, it is not possible. Everybody knows something about something and not everything about everything. And similarly, when you look at financial literacy, it is needed for different segment of the people in different terms. One of the deputy governor made a talk on that, I will just quote that and say. He talked about five different kind of illiterates. The first thing is, he said, informed illiterates. These people know everything, but still they will go and put money where it is risky and burn their finger and cry. And these people do not need any advice at all. They are called informed illiterates. The other segment is called greedy illiterates. Now, these people know, for example, you get a lot of uh, information, your account is be credited 500,000 pounds, so you have been chosen because of your mobile number. Some London fellow says, because of your mobile number you have been chosen 500,000, you do not even think for a while, but you are immediately elated, the thought itself warms. And then he says, to clear this, you please send 50,000 rupees to this account. 
then for 5 lakh pound is the most important. So, you pay 50,000, 30,000, 100,000 and I end up paying 2-3 lakhs finally to find. You are paying to a local fellow sitting in Mumbai somewhere and later on you find nothing and you go and complain. Now, these are all greedy illiterates. It's not that they don't know. They know. You cannot do anything about that. You must allow them to lose only thing, give caution and warning which Reserve Bank puts on its website continuously. The third one is real illiterates, illiterate illiterates. They just don't know anything. The rural sector. Even in the urban sector, contract labor, labor, they don't know anything. And when they do not know, how they will go and access? It is these people who forms the most important crux to whom you must give knowledge about the financial services. The other one is that Ill, less informed illiterates, for example, a housewife, or they know they go to the bank and all like that. I'm not saying housewife, not that even houseman, if there is anything, it includes all. So they have less information, and without knowing what is the cost, what they are doing, they may do without knowledge. For example, you take a credit card and you start using it, you delay default by one day. The charges are fabulous. You cannot do anything about it, and you never read the fine prints which are so small and running 10 pages you never read, but simply say the nice card, you take it and you start spending later on land in terms. So, that is one thing. And last, the thing about kindergarten illiterates, that is about the school children, college going kids and they need because this is the foundation for that it should form part of the curriculum. So, financial inclusion cannot be sustainable unless there is financial literacy. So, financial inclusion and financial literacy together form a very, very important thought. This has been pronounced by global bodies also that you cannot segregate these two and unless financial literacy is provided and simply the financial in, uh, services keeps growing, then there is every possibility more and more accidents takes place which results in loss of money to the common so, this is very important. So, I think financial literacy in this context also, the Reserve Bank has done a lot of things and there was a bank to set up financial literacy centers, number of centers are increasing and I tell you organization like that, what Misha, that it is a very noble organization in the sense, focusing on financial literacy, going to the real place where people who need information, who do not have, you convey that and also to school kids. And this is a very, very important service that this institution is providing. And I am very glad I could join the deliberations today. And very appropriately, this title has been chosen for this seminar. I congratulate Mishra for choosing this topic and choosing the right audience so that this concept of financial inclusion, financial literacy, which is gaining immense support with the current government and Reserve Bank of India, will grow further and slowly to eliminate the illiteracy part in that and more inclusive that takes place. Thank you for your time.